I'm Heike Klüver and I'm presenting this paper which is co-authored by Christine Mahoney from the University of Virginia who unfortunately can't be here with us today. Um, this paper is actually more of an application of quantitative text analysis to the field of interest group studies and more specifically interest group framing. So essentially we're trying to um, test whether quantitative text analysis can be used in order to systematically study framing um, of interest group and uh, the impact on policy outcomes. Before I start, let me give you a brief overview of the structure of the presentation. I will first say a little bit of the, about the motivation, why framing is important, and what is the current state of the art um, in this field. Afterwards, I will briefly illustri illustrate our quantitative text analysis approach, and I won't say too, too much about it, because Cheryl is actually going to be going into more detail about the different techniques, as we have a very related um, technique that we're using in our analysis. Afterwards, I will then present the research design of our case study in which we essentially test um, the quantitative text analysis approach and also cross-validate it by comparing it to results from other techniques. And afterwards, I will conclude then with a summary of the findings. So essentially, what is framing? Framing, as we understand us, and here we follow Entman and from 1991, framing is understood as selecting and highlighting some features of reality while omitting others. So essentially, if you, for instance, talk about a legislative proposal, there might be different aspects in a policy proposal that you might want to emphasize. For instance, if you're an industry group, you want to emphasize the impact of a certain legislative proposal on the industry, on your market share, on your employment um, prospects. Whereas, if, for instance, if you're an environmental group, you want to maybe emphasize the impact of a proposal on the environment and pollution, global warming, etc. So essentially, framing can determine which interests mobilize. It can determine how many objects mobilize, so which kind of groups are mobilizing in the legislative policy debate. And finally, also, what policy options are considered. So what kind of options are actually on the table? What kind of um, elements of proposal are discussed? <coughs> and interest groups, therefore, strategically use political rhetoric to steer a political debate into a direction that strengthens their position on the legislative proposal. If we look at the literature, we find there's a lot of um, classical work, for instance, by Schatzschneider and Riker, who emphasized more conceptually and theoretically um, the importance of framing, how you spin a debate, how you kind of sell your argument, how you make your point, that this is a crucial impact on the outcome of politics. In terms of um, empirical studies, we, however, have only few um, few studies so far. One is, for instance, by Druckmann, which um, studied framing at the mass level, so at the public opinion level. And in terms of interest groups, we only have two studies, essentially, that empirically try to look into framing, but also study this on the surface, so don't really provide systematic data, um, which were Baumgartner and also my co-author, Christine Mahoney. So the problem that we had so far in interest group research is essentially that we had hardly any systematic data on interest group framing um, in this realm. So essentially what we're trying to do here, what the research question is of this paper is whether we can apply quantitative text analysis to study interest group framing and its effect on policy outcomes. So on the one hand, study the framing techniques, so the framing and um, the argumentation of interest groups, but also the impact on actual policy outcomes, on actual policy debates. So what is our approach? And here again, I'm not going into too much detail because Cheryl is also talking about this later. So essentially what we're trying to do is um, combining a cluster and a correspondence analysis, um, which is based on core kinds of words in different texts. And here we follow Cheryl's approach that she's um, success successfully applied to different studies of um, speeches and also committee deliberations. The underlying assumption that essentially um, is the basis for this approach is that words that co-occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meaning and documents that contain similar word patterns tend to have similar topics. In this approach we essentially use class analysis to identify frames using an unsupervised ascending hierarchical class analysis, so essentially an automated class analysis based on word co-occurrences. Um, in order to identify different frames. So, for instance, whether you emphasize the environmental aspect of a proposal or the um, job-related aspect of a proposal. In the second step, we then run a correspondence analysis in order to um, identify and to assess the dimensionality of policy debate. So, is the policy debate truly unidimensional? Similarly, with referring to what Will was talking about earlier, do we really only observe one dimension, one structure of conflict, or are two different or even more different dividing lines that um, distinguish the positions of different actors? And we use um, a ready-made software package called TLAB for this analysis. So, what is our research design of the case study? We test um, the applicability of this quantitative text analysis approach based on um, 
based on a legislative debate on CO2 car emissions, which was taking place in the European Union in 2007. And we essentially chose this um, case because um, I conducted a study in 2009 using three different techniques, hand coding, wordfish, which was uh, the topic of Will's speech, at least partly, the scaling model that he was uh, talking about, and also word scores. Um, and we essentially hear independent estimates that we can compare to our results from the quantitative text analysis of framing. The documents that we use in order to um, study the framing of interest groups are on the interest group side, the submissions and online consultations of the Commission. So whenever the European Commission launches a new um, legislative debate by introducing a new proposal, it um, before essentially conducts a consultation in which um, the interested public, also interest groups, can submit comments. And we use these comments to extract the argumentation, the framing strategies. In order then to then study the impact on the um, actual legislative outcome, so the outcome of the policy debate, we use the communication of the European Commission, which essentially set the framework for the consultation, and then the preamble of the final legislative proposal adopted by the European Commission. And here are already the results of the um, first step of an analysis, or the cluster analysis. So essentially, the cluster analysis arrived at three different clusters, which we term the press cluster. For instance, here you then see the 15 most important words that identify the cluster. And here you see words like advertising, press, media, promotional. So clearly talking about the impact of the legislative proposal on the media. The second cluster we then term the industry cluster. And these are essentially um, arguments about the impact of the proposal on the um, automotive industry in Europe. So using words such as target, political value, uh, automotive model segments. So essentially talking about the different industry aspects. And the third cluster, which is called environment and alternative industry, which is just cut here because of space, um, is essentially employed by environmental groups as well as automo alternative automobile industry groups who produce um, so-called alternative um, vehicles such as electric cars, hybrid cars, biofuels. And these essentially join together and argued um, about the superiority of electric cars and alternative cars and also about the global uh, the environmental impact of that proposal. And here you see the um, cluster membership of the different um, text or the different actors in our analysis. We had 23 interest groups, all of kind of different interest groups. So for in this industry, uh, sorry, here, the traditional industry, for instance, the European Automobile Association, um, environmental groups like Greenpeace, and then these are the alternative industry groups. And then we have a bunch of other groups, either the press groups and then a couple of, you know, the consumer groups, for instance, essentially here. And what you see here is um, how we um, coded the interest group type beforehand using information about the interest groups gathered from the submissions and also from websites. And here you see the cluster membership score. So um, to what extent they belong to the different clusters identified by the text analysis. And here the predicted best solution. Now you can see that most of actually most of the different interest groups essentially correspond in the um, cluster they belong to. For instance, all the different alternative industry groups as well as most of the environmental groups belong to the environment cluster, and here most of them belong to the industry cluster. So you see the kind of correspondence between what kind of group they are and what kind of arguments they put forward. Interestingly, you see that the commission here at two different time points. First is classified <coughs> as mostly environment, so mostly using environmental argumentation, environmental rhetoric. But then the second, uh, the second time point actually uses more of the industry terms, so it seems to be affected by the industry in its um, legislative proposal. And here are the results of the correspondence analysis. So the correspondence analysis essentially gives you um, estimates or coordinates um, in the policy space. And this correspondence analysis identified a two-dimensional space in which the first dimension accounted for about 58% of, of the association, and then the second about 42%. And you see that essentially most of the interest groups up, um, oppose each other on the first dimension, which we term the pro-anti-environmental protection dimension. So essentially here is really about the impact on the environment, how strong should be the reduction target, how much reduction should be necessary. But then also that a couple of groups here have very much, um, have a very strong stake on the second dimension. And these are essentially the press groups um, in the debate. And interestingly, you see here the commission moving from the first time point to the second time point towards the traditional automobile industry indicated here. So again, we would conclude that the traditional automobile industry was successful in its framing efforts. Now, how valid is our estimation? How valid is this technique? So in order to um, provide some cross-validation to test our uh, approach, 
um, we compared our estimates to um, independent estimates gathered in another study in 2009, in which we first of all hand coded this um, different text, or actually I did this back then, and then we run uh, two scaling models, the word fish and the word scores. And as you can see, there's a strong correlation on the first dimension between all three techniques, but very little one on the second dimension. So what kind of seems to happen is that the TLAB analysis strongly corresponds or strongly confirms the first dimension, but in addition also identifies the second dimension. In order to um, shed more light on this second dimension, so what is actually the nature of the second dimension, um, we looked into the share of sentences devoted to different policy categories. So the hand coding was based on about 41 different policy categories. And there was one about the press industry. So we looked at how much of this um, press industry was actually emphasized in the different text. And as you can see, there's essentially only two groups uh, mentioning this at all, and also to a very strong extent, which are two um, representatives of the press industry, here and here. So which essentially would um, confirm the findings of the TLAP analysis, that essentially most of the other groups oppose each other on the first dimension, but there is something that is very important to two groups, which then spans the second dimension. So in conclusion, um, framing is indeed at the core of understanding the outcomes, but little systematic data is available. So, so far we unfortunately have little systematic knowledge about how framing um, comes about and how much framing has an influence on policy outcomes. This is mainly due to methodological difficulties in systematically studying framing. So this was mostly based on case studies, on interviews, but little um, large and data which allows us to really test all the different theories about framing. In this study, we therefore introduced quantitative text analysis to the study of interest group framing. And in the case study, which we also had independent estimates for, we show that our results actually highly correlate with estimates obtained from other techniques, most precisely, more precisely hand coding, word fish and word scores. And therefore, we believe that our, um, our results are actually confirmed by the um, different other ones. Okay, so yeah, indeed, um, quantitative text analysis allows for identifying frames and for assessing multidimensionality of, poli multidimensionality of policy debate, uh, which these three techniques couldn't as well was actually saying before.